Very good. So I'm going to go ahead and call the legislative um, uh, committee uh, or the legislative action for the Board of County Commissioners to order for um, October 27th. Let the record reflect that we have all three commissioners present and uh, we do not have any uh, presentations. Um, uh, we do have a notice of public hearing uh, as uh, item number one and then other various resolutions. Uh, we do have uh, two uh, public hearings that'll be items 4A and 4B. The, the chair is open to a motion with regard to items one, two, and three. Mr. Chair, I move to approve items one, two, and three, including all sub items. We'll second the motion. Okay, I've got a motion and a second to approve items one, two, and three on all the sub items appearing there under. Any uh, discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Reflex the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Then moving on to uh, Hearing item number 4A, this is the matter of disposing certain uh, county owned uh, personal property by public auction, project number P like in Peter 11970. And uh, I believe we have a presentation from purchasing. Not anymore. Or missing a we don't have a presentation for purchasing. So Terry Roberts dropped off. Is Terry Roberts on the line? She was on. No, she was on Zoom. She just lost she her. On Zoom. Okay. Who oh. make it back? We will uh, give her an opportunity to get back on before we uh, do our uh, hearing on our, on our county case. budget. So, yes, Terry. Hi, Terry. All right. Ms. Terry Roberts, we have you. Uh, Did we lose her again? No, she's. Oh, there she is. All right, you're up, Ms. Roberts. Are you there? You're muted, you need, Terry. Uh, unmute. Unmute, and then we can hear you better. Go ahead and unmute. There you go. Okay. Hi, Terry. I can hear somebody back there. Yeah, I can hear you. You there, Ms. Roberts? Hello? Hello? She doesn't have a speaker on her computer, so she's going to call her. Perfect. Okay. Does she have a presentation? She just. I love technology. That's right. We'll have to tell our purchasing director to loosen up the purse string a little bit. Give his, <laughs> give his employees a microphone for their computer. Exactly. I appreciate his conservatism, though. Yeah. Ten dollars. <laughs> Bring in a couple N95 masks. <laughs> yeah. Get a speaker. Would you like to call in on my phone? Mm -hmm. Well, I just got the phone with the two. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, let's try calling her it says the screen is different today. We cannot see three. who's in the meeting. We can give her a call at 230. What? 230. You want me to call? Oh, six four one. Say it again. Three three zero six four one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. She did ask me. This is Arian, though. Arian's not a panelist. Oh. Here. 
period here. She will be. Sorry. See Josh and Perry get here earlier because of just motion and second. So long to get in. I thought with this new laptop, I'd have everything all set. I think you need to talk to people in purchasing about getting you a better setup. We have the evidence that we're people there. Here so. so you are you are up in terms of uh, any uh, any um, comments or presentation you want to make on uh, uh, the hearing item four A, disposing certain county owned property. So the four is yeah. yours. Yes, the, there are a number of items, a majority of them are items that are going to be disposed of because we've already cannibalized all the useful parts out of them. Uh, IT has gone through them and taken everything that's useful and there's I think like three items that are going to auction. Uh, but outside of that, it's our standard items that are no longer of value to Spokane County. Okay. So any questions, uh, either uh, uh, Commissioner Kearns or CUNY uh, for um, Ms. Roberts? Okay, see so nobody offer up. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up the uh, hearing to anybody in the audience who'd like to provide any testimony on hearing item 4A. Second call for anybody who wants to provide testimony on 4A. Third and final call, seeing nobody uh, expressing a desire to speak to uh, hearing item 4A, I'm going to close the hearing and look to my fellow commissioners for direction. Mr. Commissioner Chair, Burns. I move to approve item 4A uh, as presented by staff. I'll second that. Got a motion and a second to approve item 4A as presented by staff. Okay. <clears throat> Any discussion? Say none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Let the record reflect. Motion passed unanimously. Then, getting on to. Thank you very second, much. Thank you. Our uh, second in a series of uh, county uh, uh, budget um, presentations for uh, 2021. Uh, Mr. Petrovich. Thank you, Commissioner. Now lead us through this. Um, just a, a quick note before I start into the presentation and the slides. There was a request uh, that the city made uh, to Jerry and I for the uh, East 55 Mission building for CARES funds. They, uh, they request that instead of the city receiving the money that we uh, we direct the money directly to the Salvation Army, who would be the purchaser of that building. And then they also ask that we move uh, from a contingency fund $75,000 to, uh, uh, to the purchase, purchase price, price has gone from 1.3 to 1.375. This is the contingency for the mission canon remodel, this is not an increase in the amount that you folks allocated. This is just to reallocate part of that from the contingency to the purchase price. And then have the Salvation Army purchase the building and they will be the owner and occupant of that building. 
Any questions for Mr. Gimmel or Mr. Petrovich? Uh, so, so, okay, so the request is to have the Salvation Army purchase it. Yes. And what was the additional request? It was 1.375 million. So there was $75,000 more than the original. And I think that came out of the appraisal process that was set up where we get an appraiser or they get an appraiser and then you split the baby or whatever that is. So the, the thing that Gary and I were made sure that we understood was this is not going to increase the money that was already allocated. You had 1.3 million for the building. You had the other amount, which I think totaled 2.9 for the uh, mission, canon, and the contingency. This would go out of the contingency, 75,000, and put that into the purchase price so the Salvation Army can buy the building. And did, uh, did Carrie approve that? She did. Okay. So, <clears throat> Mr. Kearns, I'm looking for a motion. All right, I just wanna make sure we get this right. So uh, the, the the proper motion would be that, um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so, so Mr. Chair, I move uh, that we uh, provide the previously allocated CARES dollars to purchase the 55 West Mission building for the Salvation Army to own and operate the bridge housing facility. The, does that encap does that encapsulate everything? And that and we amount. we reallocate uh, seventy five thousand from the reserve account to be uh, contributed to the uh, purchase price, making the final purchase price three million one hundred and seven three million seven five million. Right. That's what you said. <laughs> And, and I think it's coming out of their contingency fund. It is. It is. It's not an additional amount of total allocation, just out of the contingency. Okay. All right. Okay, I've got a motion. I'll second that. Got a second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor, please indicate saying aye. 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 Let the record reflect the motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Petrovich and Mr. Gimmel. Indeed. Now, back to the budget hearing. Back to the budget hearing. Gina, could you uh, put the slides up? Which which one first? The PowerPoint. Yes. Very good. Um, this is our second roundtable and discussion of the, uh, the Spokane County budget. Uh, I'd also like again to thank my staff for putting the presentation together. That includes Tessa, Tony, and Jason. So uh, let's get started with that second slide. First of all, we'll just go through these items uh, point by point give you an update from uh, the first budget roundtable. Then I'll go into the uh, general fund 2021 preliminary budget comparison. Next, I'll illustrate the changes that we've made from the general fund revenues and expenses from the last presentation. The fourth item here is a highlight of the top 10 departments in the general fund. Then next would be a recapitalization of all the funds expenditures. And uh, the last two steps are to uh, what we will do to uh, try to balance the general fund budget deficit and upcoming dates for roundtables and adoption. Since the, uh, the last roundtable on uh, October 13th, two weeks ago, uh, we've had a chance to meet with uh, seven main departments in the general fund. And those are uh, fairly large departments, the Sheriff's Detention Services, Public Defender, Superior Court, Facilities, Assessor, and Auditor. 
uh, we had very good talks with those departments. And again, these are uh, departments that willingly came to us and understood the nature of, of that first budget uh, roundtable where we, we were uh, showing a deficit of $11.6 million. So we, we started the discussions with, with them uh, looking at costs that they could trim from this year's budget to help solve that budget deficit. Uh, next, I'll discuss also the effects of the VERP on the budget departments and uh, review at the end of the uh, our revenue assumptions. Let's get into some details here, which is the next slide. So the, the number you'll probably want to concentrate on is the, the bottom right number. We, we went from an estimated projected deficit in the general fund uh, of 11.645 million to 8.4 million. And that's a difference of approximately uh, $3.25 million in, in reductions. You can see each of the categories that are highlighted there, both on the revenue side and on the expense side. So uh, we, we were able to make uh, quite a bit of difference in, in this uh, budget uh, hearing, and that was due to the, again, the, the acquiescence and, and the uh, willingness of these departments to, to come to us and to see where they, they could trim some of their uh, current submitted budget. So let's, let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk a little bit about how we got to that $3.25 million. First of all, on the revenue side, our first uh, projected revenue out of the gate was 190 million, 191 million, really. And uh, we were taking a look at uh, the, the sales tax and how the sales tax uh, was trending for this year and how we had compared it to last year and what we're projecting, of course. So sales tax is actually trending a little ahead of what we had budgeted for 2020. And we had budgeted a uh, million dollars less in revenue from sales tax for our initial 2021 budget submission. So uh, conservatively, we, we added an increase to that sales tax projection of a half a million dollars to go from 57 million to 57 and a half million. Uh, next, there were some uh, items within that large category of charges for services, and uh, that that you know when we took a closer look at that, there were some estimates that we had underestimated. Therefore, we went back and looked at it and came up with a more reasonable estimate, which resulted in almost six hundred thousand dollars in revenue estimate increases. And then the last, there were some indirect revenue from other county funds that amounted to uh, about 370,000 in other financing source increases. So when you add all that up, we're looking at a revenue increase of 1,464,000 to bring our new revenue total up for the general fund of 192,418. Then the next slide, shows the progress that we made on the expenditure side of things. And, and here is where um, I've listed where we started at uh, in our initial rollout of 202,599. And then I've listed the departments where we, we saw some significant decreases due to those departments' willingness and, and looking in the areas that they could cut. First of all, uh, the Sheriff's Office uh, wanted to be able to decrease their budget by $1,430,000, a significant amount. And they did so by looking at a lot of their vacant positions, uh, their overtime, and uh, they really studied it and took a look at what they had and the practicality of what their, their spending would be on some of these positions. And so I, I, I really have to give a shout out to them for doing an outstanding job in looking at, at what they could <coughs> trim their budgets with by that, that amount. Um, next was facilities. Again, they did the same thing, looking at areas in which they could uh, cut 
vacant positions and some m and supplies that resulted in savings of 154,000. Next was the assessors because of some ver vacancies and moving of some of their staff around and not hiring certain positions that resulted in a decrease of uh, their budget of about 107,000. The <coughs> auditor also was able to move some positions around and delay some hirings, which, all, uh, which was, uh, resulted in almost $70,000 uh, worth of savings. Then there were some other decreases from some minor things that added up to a total decrease in expenditures of 1.73 million. So now we're down to a new general fund expenditure budget of 200,816,000. And that difference between the revenues and expenditures is our $8.3 million, $8.397 million deficit at this point. So a little bit of a deeper dive in the next slide. And I don't want to uh, get too far into the weeds, but I just do want to illustrate uh, the point here that the top 10 departments in the general fund make up uh, over 75% of the general fund budget. And I've listed each of these departments uh, from the column on the far left in uh, decreasing order. And they are the sheriffs, the jail, which is a contract and it's confinement. And it, what they do is they, they uh, charge the general fund uh, a proportionate share of their total costs, and that's how the general fund pays for them. Then next is the prosecutor, public defender, superior court, juvenile facilities, data processing, auditor, and district court. Cumulatively, in they add up to, again, 75.1%, and their total submissions in, their, in uh, two weeks ago was 152,493. And as of today, uh, they've trimmed a total of 1.653 million to bring it down to 150,841. There's a whole bunch of remaining departments, uh, about 30 plus, that constitute the remaining 49,975. So that's, that's to give you a perspective of where the money is in the general fund and which departments uh, are what percentage component of those uh, funds. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Yes, Gary. Just to clarify too that these figures that we're looking at on budget and revenues do not at this point include either the road shift or the 1% property tax? That is, uh, the 1% property tax was, was, figured, was in, figured in, but not the road shift. But not the road shift. Thank you. Um, and, and it's a good point that you bring this up too, because there's gonna be other things that haven't yet to be calculated that's not in the general fund. And one of the larger things that will affect the general fund is the effect of the early retirement verb. And if everyone uh, was approved to take that verb uh, between now and January 31st, it would affect the general fund to the extent of about $800,000. Now that being said, there's going to be some offset <coughs> to the general fund departments for their spending of CARES funds. And those care fund offsets could result in savings in this year of up to maybe two million or more dollars. So that's just some of these things that are in play that we don't have dollars yet for. Right. To, to explain. Thank you. Sure. On the next slide, uh, this is a summarization that I presented last time that just shows you the magnitude of all of the funds rolled up. So if we take a look at where we're at now, uh, all funds, we are at $656 million. And that compares to last year's adopted budget of $661.5 million. Now the next slide is where a lot of the work starts. Again, we're uh, 
we're going to use this time between now and the next uh, budget roundtable to meet with additional departments to explore uh, their cost savings and also in light of the verbs uh, sensitizing that to again the uh, the examples already set by the departments that have have trimmed their budgets by looking at open positions and what they could do personnel wise to trim their 2021 budget submissions. And I will have to say that uh, they have been excellent in working with me. All of the department heads and elected officials have willingly come to the table, recognizing that this is a countywide deficit problem. And, and I have to give them uh, my, my gratitude and thanks for, for doing so. And then lastly on this slide, uh, we are going to continue analyzing all general fund revenue assumptions as we get more information in on actuals and talk with more of the departments on how their revenue streams have been affected this year, uh, we'll be able to give you some better revenue up updates. And then the next slide, yes. Uh, Gary, uh, uh, how, how are we going to, do you have any idea how we're going to finish 2020? Uh, I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, expenses that we anticipated incurring in 2020 that clearly didn't materialize. Uh, there were a lot of expenses that we encountered that we didn't anticipate. But overall, are we going to be uh, ahead or behind in terms of uh, the 2020 budget? Uh, that's a very good question. And, Thank you. And I'm that's looking I'm at it <laughs> from the standpoint of uh, how it affects our, our cash position yeah. and our fund balance. And uh, as you know that uh, on our financial statements, when we closed our uh, 2019 financial statements, we had an ended balance of about uh, 43, a little over $43 million. And in going through where we're at now through nine months of operations, plus looking at you know, uh, revenue and sales tax collection figures, uh, I gave you a previous estimate that we would probably use up maybe a, in a net sense, maybe two to $3 million. So right now I'm still looking at a starting or an ending fund balance in 2020 of about 40 million, maybe a little bit more because of the CARES funds offset. So that's good news. It could, I, I'm conservative in saying 40, but it could be more. So with, with that, we're, we're taking a look at still having a pretty good balance on hand in our general fund as we end the year. And that'll be incorporated, of course, into your adopted budget with what we'll estimate the ending fund balance to be. Okay, thank you. And then the last two slides, the last slide here are the dates of the next budget hearing or budget workshops and then the, the way in which you can reach the budget office for any questions or information. And also on the website will be posted some additional uh, supplemental budget information that further breaks down some of the numbers that you've seen in the slides. Gary, how, how much does that one percent bring in? Well, about $600,000, one percent. Okay. Any questions, uh, either Commissioner Cooney or Kearns? Uh, so, Gary, um, you know, since this is the first time seeing these slides for me, um, then as I have additional questions, can I ask you, um, I guess, as we go along? Absolutely. Oh, certainly. <laughs> and, 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 Absolutely. You know what? We're collecting and compiling this information right up to the minute. So we had these slides prepared just hours ago. Okay. And that's when I sent them out. But that brings up a really good point too, because we are going to have our next uh, budget roundtable on November 10th. And we would like to follow that up either right at that date or sometime very near that date on uh, some workshops, because we'll have to go through some scenarios that, uh, that the commissioners might need to make some decisions on in order to be able to adopt and finalize the budget. Okay, I guess that's, you know, 
be new for you this year, you know, with us, you know, um, thank you. I appreciate that because that, that then lets me know that we, we will have some follow-up workshops to figure out how we're analyzing and handling the budget and getting down to a balanced budget. So one, one of the questions that you'll have to decide in the future is the point that Jerry uh, brought up is a, a road levy shift if you decide to do that. And again, you know, those are, those are the kind of questions and decisions that we'll, we'll try to lay out for the board for you to see the effects on, on the general fund budget deficit. So uh, uh, an item that uh, Jerry and I were talking about before the board meeting started was that, uh, you know, we had in our calendars a blockout on that uh, third week uh, for uh, the WASAC conference. And obviously that's not going to be taking place uh, this year in the format that it originally was and stuff. So if we wanted to schedule in that week uh, some uh, budget workshops, I mean, that's an opportunity for us uh, since we've got some uh, holes in that, uh, that week uh, that we can fill in. So uh, just uh, food for thought as we uh, kind of close in on what this uh, budget's going to look like. So yeah, they're still doing that virtually. Um, right. Understanding. So I, I, I don't know what the schedule is, but we'd have to see what, the, what their schedule is. Yeah, it's still going to be a virtual. So we, the, the issue is we don't have any travel to deal with. We're all going to be here in town and uh, a workshop uh, uh, is, is highly possible since we're and we'll, we'll work around the schedule for WASAC, but it's going to be not the same kind of uh, uh, conference they've had in the past. So um, just an opportunity. Uh, any other questions for Gary or Jerry or anybody else? Okay. I would like to just, again, Gary was made a really good point. The, the departments, especially what, you know, the heavy hitters as far as the general fund, <coughs> Literally, with, I can't even think of an exception how cooperative everybody's been. This has not been gnashing the teeth, end of the world, oh my God, the sky's falling. People have been very businesslike, very creative, and, and very helpful. So, Okay, so then uh, that uh, completes uh, uh, the uh, budget hearing. Uh, the next item, uh, the only other item we had for this afternoon is a presentation from uh, Aaron uh, Gattel on the fairgrounds. I don't know whether Aaron has joined us or not. Sure. There she is. So, uh, and you do have a handout uh, for this that was uh, uh, given out yesterday. So, if you uh, can. There it is. So, uh, Aaron and. <laughs> I'm here. Hello, everyone. Yep. Hey, um, Jessica McLaughlin should be coming in as well. She will be the master of our PowerPoint. There she is. So um, last time we, I mean, we spoke a few times, but back at the beginning of the summer when we were canceling the fair, we were talking about going virtual and having a fair food drive through. And we just wanted to share this PowerPoint with you to update you on, on how well those things went. So I'll turn it over to Jesse. Perfect, thank you, Erin. Can everybody hear me okay? Hi, Jesse. Perfect, thanks. Welcome to the PowerPoint presentation. I don't know how many of you got to come out and take part in any of our activities, but we sure hope you did. And I thought that I would share today with you what we did. All right, so Gina, do I have control or are you advancing for me? Ron has control, but you can just let him know next page if you like. Next page, perfect. So we had over 4,000 cars come through our event. It was a little crazy out here during those six days. You can see the numbers there as far as how many we had each of those days, but we indeed had over 4,300 cars. And go ahead, advance. Those 4,300 cars made 13,900 food orders while they were here, which is the average of 3.22 vendor visits per car. And they were all in their cars. They did not get out. So, um, but almost 14,000 orders placed. Go ahead. 
there you can see the gross sales that the vendors reported. That big number at the top right was showing how much the gross was overall. It was just shy of 200,000. It was an average of $44, a little bit over $44 per car that they were spending when they came in. And obviously that second Saturday was our biggest day, probably because the word got out. And so we had a very busy day that day. Go ahead and advance. This shows our sales by the vendor. Our biggest seller was Azars, followed by the King Corn Dog. So these were vendors that we went through and we tried to decide if they would make a good fit for this event. Even though Pizzerita didn't do as well as the others, as you can see there, they were very happy with the opportunity to be out here and to do something. You can see our gross sales again, we're $200,000. That's not what we take, um, not, not our, not our revenue, but the state sales tax that we generated was a little over 15,000. Our percentage this year was 18% of that vendors. And so we um, took in just shy of $32,000 of revenue for the event. Go ahead. How did we do it? We did it with a handful of staff and 40 volunteers. And you can see the makeup of those volunteers that put in over 322 hours to make this event happen. The fun part was we even had managers, board members from three other fairs from the region come in and help us do that. They were out ticketing, you know, doing the cars, tagging them, not ticketing them, but tagging the cars, directing traffic. Um, but it took a, a whole team to make this happen for sure. Go ahead and advance. Not only did we do the fair food drive through but we did have a virtual fair in which people could exhibit with us via either video or photograph. We had 120 adults come and play in that fashion as well as 99 youth. 4-H helped us out by spreading the word, so you can see the breakdown of the youth there, 39 4-H kids um, and some FFA as well as open youth, and open youth is anyone not in 4-H or FFA, but we were pleased to have those 219 people come and participate this year. Many of them have been participating since they were tiny kids all the way up to 80 plus years old. Go ahead and advance. Those 219 exhibitors put in 727 exhibits. Now that's not the 14,000 that we normally get, but 727 was something and it was something to keep our tradition alive for many of the families in this area. The other thing that came out of this um, thinking outside of the box that we got to do was um, that picture to the left hand side is our top hay producer this year. That's not a new event. We do that each year as far as um, sampling hay and deciding who has the best hay in the area. But in the middle there, you'll see Pat Muntz from Small Farms and she came over and helped us with all the core sampling. Not something she's done for us before or with us. And so those kind of partnerships were something that we really enjoyed coming out this year and hope to keep um, going forward for many, many years. Our biggest category obviously was photography. They have been virtual as far as accepting entries for a few years and so people were already familiar with that format. But we also had a great showing from horses and from our floral. And it's one of the reasons why we decided to do this virtual fair is things like floral because if you have that beautiful flower, it's not gonna be that beautiful flower next year. It's a one in a lifetime chance. So we were pleased that we were able to offer that and see that many flowers come in. Go ahead. We also had some great partners in regards to some contest sponsors. This one, the largest pumpkin contest was sponsored by Jennifer's Auto. You can see the winner there, Jerry Klum. He's out of Spokane Valley. By the way, the top three pumpkins all came from 12th Avenue in Spokane Valley. So I'm not sure if it's the soil or the water but they have something going on out there. We also took the opportunity to do a guess the weight contest on social media with that pumpkin, which weighed an amazing 830 pounds. We had 449 guesses and the winning guess was within three pounds of the correct weight. Go ahead. We also reached out to some of our nonprofits that have had typically something to do with the fair in the past, whether it's a 10 day booth or an appearance for an event and ask them if they would like to participate. They had a booth at the world's largest drive, fair food drive through on those dates. And together um, they were able to raise just shy of $4,000 on the dates that they were here. Go ahead. We also set up a YouTube channel 
So it is still live, obviously. You can go out and visit it at Spokane County Interstate Fair. We posted, with the help of a great friend, 64 YouTube videos out there, including messages from our director, a new segment called Live from the Stock Pen, which gives people the opportunity to educate more about livestock. That event was sponsored by Boot Barn this year. We had Fair Classroom 101, and all of these were videos that, yes, they were out on our YouTube channel, but we had a schedule that they went live on our Facebook page as well. Fair Classroom, classroom you could learn about the Asian Hornet, or you could even see our very own Vicki Dalton teaching us how to knit a sock with a vintage antique loom. So those videos, like I said, are still available. You can go out and watch them. We also were super lucky to have a partner, TDS Fiber, come on board and help us um, offset the cost of two entertainers, which played on our video or on our um, Facebook twice a day. We had Eric Haynes and Louis Fox. So those are out there, still viewable. And this year we had a little bit of time to do circle champion videos. So those are out there highlighting all of our winners. Go ahead. You may have a question in regards to our market stock auction. It is a large part of what we do with our youth here at the Interstate Fair. They not only ready for show, but they also look forward to selling them as well. That is usually seed money for their project next year and sometimes for those seniors that's college funds going forward. We only had eight kids identify that they needed some help selling. The rest of them had already pre-sold. So with that said, those eight, you can see where we're at right now. We have five of them that are sold. One has been butchered, but her meat is still available for sale. And then we still have two that are still for sale. And so we're continuing to try to help them out. We have one goat and one lamb. Go ahead. Next slide. List of or what we call kind of the spon this, uh, sponsor suit page. For some reason, one of them didn't come out there in the center. For some, like I said, I don't know which one that was, but um, there is one sponsor that's in that spot. Columbia Bank, Ziggy's, they're the ones that offset our competitive exhibits program. So we are truly grateful for the sponsors that helped us get this year's event done. Next slide. I'll just quickly show you the three photos at the bottom. That middle picture was our fair food drive through That was not even our busiest day. That is one of our lighter days because typically we were three rows abreast all the way back to the silo Cars. and beyond. So it was really incredible seeing that. But I wanted to show you real quickly the uh, exhibitor on the left hand side is Louise Wells. She is also our Home Art Superintendent wearing her I Love Spokane Fair shirt. She entered a few items just to make sure we had some exhibits, but she wanted to make sure she could support us in one way this year, and that was how she did her support. And then on the right hand side, super cute little redhead. His name is Jonathan Morrison. He's eight years old and his chicken Matilda. And they Googled virtual fairs and he entered Matilda. He is from South Carolina. So our entries did not just come from local, but also from far away. Early on, we talked as a staff that we wanted to do something because we knew something was better than nothing. And our staff, our volunteers, our team put together an amazing something. And that's all I have. Very good. Do I have any, any questions? Any questions? Mary Cooney? No, I just heard nothing but great things about the drive through food i mean it was too bad the smoke hit you know that first weekend you know which was a little little sad but um yeah no i i've heard nothing but great things so thank you for continuing the tradition for our county residents and um and beyond and and making it happen because that you know was very disappointed there was a lot of people that disappointed but you guys made it happen so thank you You're welcome it was our we pleasure. appreciate that we had a lot of fun and it gave us a little slice of normalcy, just a little bit, but it was great. Hey, Aaron and Jesse and Fair Talk, is this taking, making a silk purse out of a sow's ear? Is that what you guys did? <laughs> <laughs> the visual on that, Jerry, wow. <laughs> But you know, if you don't have, if you have a minute, go out and, and truly look at those YouTube channel videos because you can learn how to bathe the hog all the way up through all sorts of livestock and other things. I love things. it, finally. Super fun. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 
Any comments for you, Commissioner Kearns? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, that, I mean, clearly a ton of work went into this. Uh, you, you all did such a such a marvelous job. I mean, you, know, you, you really had to turn on a dime and, and do something completely, completely different. And so I just want to, congratulations. We're so proud of your whole team out there, Aaron. Uh, you all just really stepped up and, and hit a home run with this. I just th thank you so much for, for, um, for bringing, you know, making sure the fair did still happen in, uh, in, in Spokane County. So th thank you very much for, for everything you, you are all doing out there. And we appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, echo the comments from my fellow commissioners. Uh, kudos to you and the team. Very creative uh, uh, approach. And uh, obviously, uh, you uh, hit it right on the head and stuff. So uh, uh, another question, how long uh, are, the, are the outdoor uh, uh, drive-in movie theater operations, are they still going or uh, have they suspended for the rest of the year? They are still going. Their intention is to go through November, weather permitting. They did have to cancel for Friday and Saturday with the storm. Okay, good. And still getting good crowds for that? Yeah, I think it's lightened up a little bit, but they had a Stevie Nicks concert on Sunday night, and that was pretty popular. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right, anything else for uh, Aaron and her team? Well, thanks for the update. Keep it up. Thanks, guys. You Have betcha. a great afternoon. Okay. Bye. So, so Mr. Gimmel, we have uh, another guest here. Yes. Uh, introduce. Hello. Well, well, commissioners, uh, we just want to bring up to speed on a uh, an item that's going to go to effect the first of January, twenty twenty one. If everything still sticks uh, to the current plan, this is an unfunded mandate uh, from the state. No action today, commissioners, is required from you. Uh, we just wanted you to be aware of this item called the Unified Guardianship Act. We're very blessed to have Superior Court uh, Judge Rachel Anderson here. And Ron, we should have uh, Judge Clark, uh, I believe, also. Yes, and is Ashley joining us? She brought this originally to my attention. This was coming down the pike. There she is, I see her. So um, we just love to give you a short briefing on what it is. And, and Judge Anderson, maybe you could uh, start out ask, just. You want Ashley and yes, Clark. Ashley and Judge Clark. And Judge Clark. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Whenever you want me to start, just let yeah. me know. No, no go ahead. The floor is yours. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for letting us um, present this bit of information to you. Um, I'm here in person because I was just upstairs and didn't want to have Zoom problems, but I do have Judge Clark and Ashley on the Zoom. And I wanted to first just explain that this is the Uniform Guardianship Act. It was passed um, by the legislature and the implementation they gave us all of this year could have gone into effect in January of 2020, but they gave us to January of 2021 to implement um, the new law because it really overhauls two areas. One is the guardianship area, which regards adults um, that need both a personal guardian and a financial guardian, and then also minors. And the minor guardianship is doing away with all of the non parental custody family law cases. So starting this January, we will no longer have what has been known as non parental custody cases. That action will be gone, and it'll have to be filed under um, Uniform Guardianship Act, minor guardianship. Um, I was part of, Judge Clark was part of, uh, a big push to try to explain how there are um, some unfunded mandates that come along with this legislature, um, the new legislation. And one of them that really is significant is that in the new Minor Guardianship Act, there is a provision that says the court must appoint an attorney to represent a parent when they are party to a proceeding and they are objecting to the appointment of a guardian. That is brand new. That has never been part of either the Guardianship Act or the non parental Custody Act. So um, we, starting in January, we're scrambling to try to figure out uh, where to fill that niche, you know, where we're going to um, administrate those attorney, or you know, where, how we're gonna hire them, who's going to oversee them, um, just where are they going to fit in, let alone how we're going to pay for them. So I think that was, the biggest thing that I wanted to make sure you knew is what the background on why we're giving you this information. 
um, right now, the effective date is still January 1. Um, states, counties across the state are all trying to come up with the same answers. So we're not alone in our problem solving, um, but we don't have any good answers yet. Um, Judge Clark, I think, was going to fill in a little bit more from there. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, other than I'm trying to watch how to bathe my hog when I get home, I'll focus <laughs> on this topic. Who is it? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> well, it's Tuesday. Yeah. Bathe your hog day. Um, I, I miss a lot. I, I know that. Um, so on the logistics side of this, as Judge Anderson was saying, uh, this law takes effect. But what that means is that any existing what we call third party custody action gets dismissed at the end of the year. So it's not as if we're going to roll into these slowly. Uh, we're sending notices out to everybody saying he either resolve your case or at 12 on 1231 of 20, it goes away. Then they refile and they start over, which is going to be a burden upon us just to start with. Uh, and then we have these new actions coming in. As Judge Ander was, Anderson was saying, we're going to be requested to appoint some folks uh, to represent ch uh, children and indigent uh, adults that are in these actions. So well, the first part we're scrambling on is, of course, to build a list of the attorneys that we can appoint. Uh, that's on us to get that done and figure out who we have. So when we get on the bench, first, second, third week of January, we can appoint people if we need to. The second problem on that, of course, is money. How do we pay those folks? We've got, of course, nothing in our budget. And as you know, the state gave us no money. Uh, there was a little money, I think, for training and forms, I think, out of the legislation, but there was no other money to implement it in terms of these positions. Um, you should know that the Spirit Court Judges Association has um, started an effort to delay the bill or get some state funding on it. Uh, we're going to work extremely hard. We, your county lobbyist, I know, has been connection or in contact with uh, the SCJA lobbyist, and everybody's working this issue. But reality is, you know, we're 60 days out from the start date on this thing. And again, it won't be a rolling start. It'll just be all these cases will be refiled if, if somebody doesn't get it resolved. So we're, we're left with the question of uh, having the money to do it, number one. And number two, who's going to administer these contracts? Uh, as a court, we're really not in the business of appointing and administering lawyers, um, you know, for performance. That's a bad business for us to be in. It creates conflicts. Um, so we've gone to the state and asked the Office of Public Defense, would you administer these contracts and get the money paid out wherever it comes from? Their answer was no. Uh, we've talked to the Public Defender's Office here, and, and again, they're, they're not interested. It's a civil matter. They don't want to be involved. These aren't criminal cases. So we've got the problem of if there is any money to administer, who's going to handle those funds, you know, keep track of it, get the bills paid, do the accounting work that needs to be done. And then secondly, having the money uh, in the pool to pay, pay those bills. So uh, that side of the fence, you know, we're just coming to you saying, this is our, this is where we're at. Uh, we're subject of this law on no choice of ours. We testified against it. This was not our, this was not our request. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but we're left with it just like everyone else is. And so uh, 60 days from now, we're going to be faced with these, these new cases, and we're going to be faced with this appointment process. We're building those lists, but then we're going to be faced with how to pay them. Um, and so we want to make you aware that this is out there. Uh, like I say, we're working it on the legislative side, but uh, again, it's, it's coming at us pretty fast. Commissioner Fridge? Yes. And I uh, just wanted to assure you, commissioners, that between Ashley, Tom Krasminski, Jerry, Gary, and myself, we've been working this quite a bit. Uh, another option potentially is to utilize uh, public defenders just in the region, is to contract this out. So we're really, really looking at the administration of, the financing of, now we're going to pull this off. I just also wanted you to know that uh, uh, Eric Johnson in Wasack is very familiar with this, and so Mike Burgess, um, our lobbyist, is also very familiar with this uh, item. But as we speak right now, on January 1st, uh, this does go to effect, so we've still got some more work to do uh, to figure this all out. Um, Jerry, that should be on our legislative agenda. Yeah. Jump all over that thing. Yeah. Okay. May I ask a question? Yes, please. 
<laughs> Ashley or your honors, is can, is can you give us an idea numerically when this thing goes into effect, how many cases are we talking about? I mean, is it is it a thousand? Is it a hundred? How what what are we looking at? We we currently have a hundred of these files, uh, so it is a hundred. And Ashley and I were talking about it. The tricky part of this is, you know, certainly out of that hundred, and let's just say assume that we have another hundred in January. We just the same batch just for a second in terms of conversation. So again, it's, these aren't huge numbers, but we don't know of that hundred. We can't tell you how many will resolve by settlement, uh, how many might be a default, and how many may go to trial. And even if there's a small slice that goes to trial, even if it's 10, it's spending. That's it's spending. Thank you. I, I don't know how else to put it. And so we get, you know, it's just like all litigation. You just have no idea of where it's going to go. Um, we have no idea how quickly these requests are going to come in January. But but you're right. The numbers are not large. It's just that it's just an unknown for us. Thank you, Judge. When you say 100, is that 100 a month or 100 a year? We have 100 pending right now. So, I mean, it's sort of a rolling, I think, Ashley, would you indicate that that's sort of a rolling number, that it, the average is about 100 at any one look, maybe? Yes. This is sure. a weird year, so it's a little hard to, to know with COVID, because things got, obviously, for three or four months, nobody was filing anything. But um, I think that's got to be pretty close. Uh, Judge Anderson, would you say probably 100 to 150, kind of in that range? I would because I believe that number includes just the non parental custodies, not any guardianships that are dealing with minors right now. Because yeah. They all are going to be together in that new process. And there's only a handful of minor guardianships. So 150 is about the max. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> He say, says cautiously. If I could say, we do have a committee that we're working on the logistics of. Um, from the court standpoint, where we're going to put them, where they're going to be assigned, um, how they're going to fit in as a new cause of action to what we're already doing. So we've been doing a lot of work too to try to get ready for this to start in January. Thank you so, for taking the time to hear us. You bet. So if you had to quantify this on an annual basis, what the cost might be, and I know that you're looking into the dark, uh, but can you give us kind of a range? Are we talking about several hundred thousand, a couple million? Uh, what kind of, just give us, give us a fear factor here. I think you're looking in the several hundred thousand range. Uh, okay. Not, not in the millions of dollars range at all. Well, that's fearful enough. Yeah, it's fearful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, yeah, I'm sorry. I was gonna say we might liken it to what we are looking at with our guardian ad litem budgets, because it's going to be similar numbers of cases. Uh, the guardian ad litem, we have the guardianship guardians ad litem and the family law guardians ad litem. And I think that the GAL budget we have is about, I think I want to say $30,000, but I don't recall exactly. Uh, that, it's going to be, a, it's going to be a different, a little bit different of an animal though, if we start appointing when we have indigent parents, because if we have two parents, and then a guardian ad litem. So as opposed to a family law case where we have one, there are gonna be the litigated cases we're gonna have three people potentially involved. So that's where we just don't know what it's gonna really look like. Yeah. Yeah. It's a weird statute. They call it the Uniform Act. It's the only one in the United States though. <laughs> I'm real uniform. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to explain that. I. Yeah. Well, we are going to be making a, 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 a claim uh, to the state because of the uh, court decision a couple of weeks ago that said that the legislature cannot impose unfunded mandates on counties. So we are running a tally of uh, how much money this, the state owes us. Uh, we're not holding our breath, though, in terms of when that check might come and whether it'll clear or not. But um, it, it's good to know what, what all of these unfunded mandates are going to cost and, and uh, be an eye-opening experience for the legislature. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for listening to us. Appreciate yeah, you it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the heads up. All right. So uh, we're down to miscellaneous matters. Uh, any uh, miscellaneous matters that uh, either one of you have that you want to bring forward? 
Nope, I don't have anything today. Jerry? I don't have anything today, thanks. Oh. No, seriously. This <laughs> is, I, I know. This is, I, I want everybody to know that's three times in a row. Three times in a row. I don't mind being the. What's wrong, much Jerry? Much uh, what's wrong? I just. <laughs> so, so, evidently, we do have a volunteer that's going to throw himself into the ring here. Go ahead, Jerry. I just I wanted to uh, clarify a few things with the state legislative agenda. So, um, did I get head nods from everybody about adding this UGA, the guardianship item, to the actual <coughs> state legislative agenda? Anybody opposed to adding it to the agenda? Okay. Okay. And All then, right. as far as way of process, um, Jerry, Mike, and I are finalizing the list that Mike Burgess has been presenting to you over the course of the last few weeks. Um, GSI has requested that everybody submit their requests for their state agenda by Friday. Um, I have asked Kara Kuhn if it'd be all right if we give them a draft by Friday and a final by next Friday. So I've asked Gina to put Mike Burgess on the agenda for Monday or Tuesday of next week so that we can finalize it. But I expect to have the draft to all the commissioners by this Friday. Everybody all okay. right with that? Good, thank you. Okay. In terms of the federal uh, ask, uh, I know that they're, the, uh, well, based upon the news this morning, the probability of some kind of stimulus package before the election is slim and none. And uh, then there's also now speculation that before, the, there probably won't be a package before the end of the year. They'll wait until the new Congress uh, convenes before they take any action. But there is a, a debate about uh, whether part of the stimulus package should include uh, funds for lost revenues for uh, cities, counties, and states. And so you might think about whether that's something that you might want to add to the federal uh, package or not. Um, do we want to uh, go in requesting some assistance to uh, replace lost revenues and or supplement uh, what will be a difficult budget for next year uh, based upon what Gary has presented and, and uh, what looks like a, a, a second go around in terms of the, the virus shutdown and what that might be for the city, county, and state. So just throw that out for your consideration. We can talk about it more next week, unless you want to talk about it now. Uh, but that's something that also is uh, trying to percolate its way up. So um, anyway, uh, anything else, uh, Ms. Ladies? So I've got one request. Um, so the uh, SRTC, is uh, sent out a letter to all the jurisdictions uh, requesting that they appoint a representative and or representatives uh, to participate in the ILA uh, renegotiation process that'll start uh, the afternoon of November 12th after the SRTC board meeting uh, 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 adjourns and stuff. So. Um, the, I would uh, like to request, but it's certainly up to the two of you uh, to be the representative or at least one representative uh, to that process since I'm one of only three that's been through it before uh, in the county. The other two are Mike Gribner and uh, Mary Cuny, or I'm sorry, uh, Susan Meyer. I saw Mary Cuny before me and uh, spoke that. Uh, Susan Meyer, uh, uh, Mickey Harnoise, was there, but not an active negotiator in the process, but she was also uh, present during that period. So uh, unless one of you two would like to jump into that foray, uh, we're not limited to just one, we can have two, or quite frankly, we can have all three of us there if you want, but at least we have to have uh, a single point uh, identified uh, for uh, carrying the message back to the board ultimately whatever has to come out of this has to be approved by us as a legislative act so 
everything comes back to this board for final approval. Nobody can uh, uh, give any approval during the negotiating process, but at least you're part of that process. So throw that out for your consideration. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say disappoint yourself. I need to be on it. I'm I'm fine. I'm fine with you representing us, Al. Okay. Would you mind making a motion to that effect, just so that we can say that we took an action? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to appoint Commissioner Al French to represent Spokane County in the uh, negotiations or deliberations with uh, SRTC in drafting their uh, updated interlocal agreement. And I'll second that. Okay, got a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none. Did you want to say something, Mary? I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, did I cut you off? No, I okay. no more discussion. Okay, uh, then all in favor say aye. 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 Direct reflect motion passes. And actually, so we'll send a, send a notice to SRTC to that effect. Now, Mary, you are, uh, uh, you can participate as much or as little as you want in this process. So uh, just so, just because we've got a designated person, it's open to whoever wants to participate. So feel free to be part of those meetings if you'd like. All right, uh, that's all the business that's come before us. So. It is now 3 0. Oh, uh, one last thing. Uh, last night, uh, the City Council uh, voted to defer the action on the utility tax. They did not take it off the table, but they did vote to defer it. So that means it's still active and could come back anytime between now and the first week in December when they pass their final budget. So um, I've spoken to a couple people that uh, have agreed to reach out to the city council uh, and uh, uh, particularly the council president and advise him that uh, this is not going to go well if they decide to move forward with it. So we'll see what happens with regard to that, that continued action. Anything else, Jim, that you uh, want to throw in here? Well, uh, the only thing I would say is that uh, Jim and Mark and I had a conversation with an attorney that uh, and Kevin Cook was involved in that today. I don't know whether you want to go more into executive session on that or whether that can wait. There's nothing. One of the things that was mentioned is what you mentioned with the city council at the third action. Right, so right. I don't know if you want to do that. Well, now why don't we uh, tee it up for an executive session on Monday and let's see what else materializes this week. Um, and um, I think that's it. So it's now uh, 3.08 and we've completed all the business come before the board and we're adjourned. Thank you.